100 years ago today, on this hallowed ground of Smith and Ruland Shipyard, Blue Nose was launched. From William Rui's plans sprung a legend that was to carry the hopes and dreams of all of Nova Scotia. Today in 1921, Canada's most famous ship was launched in the Lunenburg Harbour. Named after the people of Nova Scotia, the Blue Nose is a symbol of hard work and perseverance. And a hundred years later, at a time when we must work together to defeat a global pandemic, it reminds us that we too can chart a course for greatness in the face of our own storm. I know this year has been challenging for everyone. Et pour ceux qui dépendent de nos océans pour faire des affaires et nourrir leurs familles, la COVID-19 a présenté des défis uniques. Voilà pourquoi notre gouvernement travaille fort pour aider tout le monde à traverser cette période difficile. Et on va continuer de faire tout ce qu'il faut aussi longtemps qu'il le faut pour assurer votre sécurité et votre soutien. As we build back better, we will use the power of our oceans and waterways to strengthen our economy, create jobs, grow the middle class, and fight climate change. I can't think of a better way to honor the Blue Nose. So today, as we celebrate the Queen of the North Atlantic, let's also take lessons from its past so we can build a better future. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Merci. As the Queen's representative in Nova Scotia, it is my pleasure and honor to bring you greetings on the occasion of the Blue Nose Launch Day, 100 years virtual event. A titre de représentant de la Reine en Nouvelle-Écosse, c'est avec grand plaisir et honneur que je vous transmets mes salutations à l'occasion du jour de la mise à l'eau du Blue Nose, une célébration virtuelle du centième anniversaire. On March 26, 1921, the fishing schooner Blue Nose was launched. The owners, builders and operators likely had no idea at the time of the launch that this vessel would become a racing champion for over two decades, and that the Blue Nose would become an enduring Canadian symbol. The Blue Nose and what it represents has particular meaning for me and my family. Both of my great-grandfathers served aboard vessels, one as captain of a four-masted barcantine called the Dominique, which sailed from Nova Scotia to the Caribbean, was lost in 1887 off of Puerto Rico, while my other great-grandfather, John Remy King, served as second officer aboard the SS Florizel and lost his life when it sank off the coast of Newfoundland in 1918. King had earlier declined appointment as captain of the ship insisting it was a job for a younger man. They, like all of those who ply the oceans for their living, knew of the constant dangers. 
Similarly, they were also enthusiastically aware of the joys of being on the water and away from the land. I am sure this was the case for the Blue Nose Captain Angus Walters and her crew. The Blue Nose and his successor, the Blue Nose II, have become defining symbols of Nova Scotia and indeed Canada. Over the years, these vessels became important sailing ambassadors for our province and country, as was the case during the G7 summit that was held in Halifax in June 1995. Such was the importance of the Blue Nose and what it represented that its image was placed on the 10 cent coin, the dime, in 1937 and has remained there ever since and is familiar to all Canadians. I am sure you will agree that seeing the Blue Nose too in full sail and knowing that it is represented on our currency is a thrilling sight and experience. Uh, before I conclude, let me commend and thank the organizers, volunteers and sponsors of the Blue Nose Launch Day 100 years. Your dedication to preserving the memory of the Blue Nose is greatly appreciated. On ce centième anniversaire de la mise à l'eau du Blue Nose, célébrant ce que cette célèbre goulette en est venue à symboliser pour les gens de la Nouvelle-Écosse et du Canada, Nous souhaitons aussi bon vent, bonne mer, au Blue Nose 2, alors qu'elle poursuit son important travail lié à la représentation de la Nouvelle-Écosse et du Canada. On this 100th anniversary of the launch of the Blue Nose, let us celebrate what this famous schooner has become to Nova Scotians and Canadians. We also wish fair winds and following seas to the Blue Nose too, as it continues its important work of representing Nova Scotia and Canada. The International Fisherman's Trophy, Halifax, 1920. In this first race between American and Canadian fishing scooters, the Esperanto out of Gloucester won over the Delawara out of Lunenburg. Determined to win the trophy back, the Canadians hired a Halifax marine architect, William J. Rue. And in March, 1921, a schooner was launched from the Smith & Ruland shipyard in Lunenburg. Her name was the Blue Nose. Her skipper was Angus Walters, and together for the next 18 years, they would beat the fastest schooners in Canada and the best American challengers. The Blue Nose was more than just a fast boat. She held the record for the largest catch of fish ever landed in Lunenburg. She represented Canada at Chicago's Century of Progress exhibition in 1933 and at King George's Silver Jubilee in 1935. World War II brought submarine battles to the Atlantic and the diesel engine was replacing sail. In 1942, despite Angus Walter's frantic efforts to raise money, the Blue Nose was sold to the West Indies Trading Company to haul freight. In January 1946, shorn of mast and sails, laden with bananas and rum, she struck a reef off the coast of Haiti and sank.
The International Fisherman's Cup was, of course, the trophy that was awarded to the vessel that won the International Fisherman's Races. And as you can see on this cup, there's only two vessels listed. The first, in 1920, was Esperanto from Gloucester. And every plaque since then has been awarded to Blue Nose, as Blue Nose was, of course, the undefeated champion. The Fisherman's Cup began as a, a reaction to a final race of an America's Cup yachting series in 1920. The competitors of, it was uh, Shamrock 4 and, and uh, Resolute, were like the boats are today. They were just finely tuned race machines, just built for speed. And the wind was too, wrong, too strong um, and they feared damaging their vessels for that day. So tails between their legs, they went up behind Sandy Hook and dropped the hook and waiting for, uh, waited for another day. Well, this caused like an immense amount of ridicule and, and derision with the public and the press, especially. I, mean, I think one newspaper called it, uh, they would have had a better, better race with paper napkin boats in a bathtub or something. And William Dennis, uh, he came, he suggested a better race. It would be one between the two largest fishing schooner communities uh, on the coast, um, Gloucester, Massachusetts and Lunarburg, Nova Scotia. I think he just was a big proponent of this province and its people. And he would do whatever he could with what he had. Uh, and he was uh, more than happy to support, whether by utilizing the newspapers to promote it, um, his radio station or to provide money or a cup or a dinner um, to advance um, Nova Scotia and the people of Nova Scotia. And that was his way of giving back, I think, one of the many ways that he gave back to the province that he loved so much, so. They called it the race for real sailors. That's how he promoted it. And they had a contest set up in the fall of the same year. Uh, and uh, the, the Yankees ended up sending up a schooner called Esperanto with the captain Marty Walsh. Um, and the Canadians entered uh, Delawana with Captain Tommy Himmelman. Unfortunately for us, the Americans won the first two races and took the cup home to the U.S. And boy, you know, that must have really hurt. It went astray in uh, the U.S. at one point in Gloucester and um, turned up uh, wrapped in a blanket at a, I think in a, at a, I don't know what they would have called it in those days, a home for abandoned children with a little note, uh, but I think it was a bit of a prank. Um, so, but there were, I think a few, uh, the insurer was called, I heard, and uh, talking about <laughs> what, <laughs> what was uh, the value of the cup and whatnot, but I think the cup symbolically meant a lot more than just the, the dollar value of it. Hello everyone, bonjour à toutes et à tous. I'm so pleased to take part in this celebration of a true Canadian icon. Il y a 100 ans, le Blue Nose a amorcé un voyage au long cours dans le cœur des gens de la Nouvelle-Écosse. Il figure au tableau d'honneur dans l'histoire de notre pays. The Blue Nose was a legend in its own time and a symbol of Nova Scotia's reputation for excellence in fishing and shipbuilding. Under Captain Angus Walters, this great ship was unbeatable she won 17 straight trophies in the international fishermen's race and came to be known as the Queen of the North Atlantic. By now, every Canadian knows the Blue Nose on sight. We all see this magnificent ship almost every day on the back of Canada's 10 cent piece. And of course, Nova Scotians take the Blue Nose with them almost everywhere, pictured proudly on their provincial license plates. Le leg du Blue Nose est encore florissant aujourd'hui grâce au Blue Nose 2 l'ambassadeur de la Nouvelle-Écosse auprès des amateurs de voile au pays et dans le monde entier. The Government of Canada is proud to support the Lunenburg Marine Museum Society in commemorating the 100th anniversary of the launch of the Blue Nose with a grant through the building communities through arts and heritage program. Today is an exciting day in Lunenburg and I know that many terrific activities have been planned to showcase your town's rich maritime heritage as well as the talents of hundreds of local artists. Although the pandemic has changed the way some of these celebrations look and feel, this virtual event means that even more of us right across the country can join you in toasting the greatest of the tall ships. Happy 100th anniversary to the Blue Nose.
as a child, uh, when he went to school, um, William James Rui, uh, while his dad at the time had started the pop factory, his passion for whatever reason, it, it didn't run in the family genes, uh, was, was boats. Um, stories I've been told and read that as a child that he would often uh, get in trouble with the teacher because rather than doing his arithmetic while sitting at his desk, he'd be doodling pictures of boats. He evolved from that to building models, four or five foot models of sailing boats that he would take to ponds in Halifax and, and race. You know, there's a story that goes that he actually asked his dad when he was maybe nine, 10 years old to put outside ballast on one of these models that he built. And at the time that was something that, you know, just wasn't heard of in this area for racing schooners. So he, um, he went, so he was, he was a young man then. Um, and as he grew older, like I said, he went to work at the family pop factory. He then, um, continued that passion by studying the Dixon camp and he was doing amateur yacht design. So they were just, they were sailboats, um, the bat, uh, which they have at the museum in Halifax was one of his first designs uh, for a sailboat. So he is so from, he numbered his designs. I'm going to hop around a little bit there. His, his designs were numbered because often when, when he designed the vessels, the name for the vessel wasn't known. So his, his numbering system for his portfolio was, was numbers. Um, Blue Nose was design number 17. He had not up until the time that he was asked to design a fishing schooner that could compete and beat the Americans in the International Fisherman's Trophy had he designed a large vessel or a fishing schooner. Um, it was a, the success of the smaller sailboats that he had designed um, that, that allowed him to become well known as a naval architect in the area. There were no other naval architects in the area. He was, he was at the cutting edge of that technology. Prior to then, they uh, usually built schooners um, from, from models, from half models. Somebody would make a half model, carve it out, and, and they would use those lines to build the boats. He was very active in going to the shipyard and looking at how things were being done and making sure that they were being done to a specification. Uh, W.J. Rui did receive uh, numerous accolades over the years. Uh, I, th I think there's probably two that um, resonated with him. And I'm going to say the, the top of the list uh, would have been a gold watch that he was presented from the town of Dartmouth, then the town of Dartmouth, 19, in December of 1921, after Blue Nose uh, won the first International Fisherman's Trophy. Um, uh, he was a proud citizen of Dartmouth, so, and I, I, know, I know that that um, that that resonated and meant a tremendous amount to him. Uh, that gold watch was that actually passed down through the family. He made sure that it stayed in the family. Uh, and it's, it's now at the Canadian Museum of History in Ottawa as part of the um, Beyond Blue Nose exhibit for W.J. Rui. Uh, and I think the other one would have been an award that he received from the Arnbill Yacht Club. He was a lifetime member, former Commodore. While he accepted the awards graciously, he, he was he was very humble. The Blue Nose story, as he said, you know, when you tell it, uh, William J. Rui is certainly an integral part of that story, but he's only a part of that story. And I say that with all due respect to him and to the rest of the of the the um, the team that made Blue Nose what she was. He was one cog on the wheel. There was Captain Angus Walters. There were the shipbuilders. Um, you know, the, there were the the men that sailed the vessel. Uh, it was the perfect storm, you know, no pun intended, but everything came together perfectly for that vessel. The design absolutely had something to do with it, but if it hadn't had competent shipbuilders or, you know, really, really great sailors or, or you know, the best captain that was on the seas at the time, um, you know, it, it would have been just another schooner. The Royal Canadian Mint is delighted to join the province of Nova Scotia and all Canadians in celebrating the 100th anniversary of Blue Nose. Au nom de tous les employés de la Monnaie Royale Canadienne, je suis ravi de me joindre à vous, la province de la Nouvelle-Écosse et tout le reste du Canada pour célébrer le centième anniversaire de Blue Nose. Blue Nose is one of our most beloved national symbols. What started as the pride of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, rapidly sailed into the hearts and minds of Canadians as the fastest and most graceful fishing schooner the world has ever seen.
It has also been a special source of pride for the Royal Canadian Mint ever since it found a home on our dime in 1937. The Blue Nose is also a source of pride for the Monnaie Royale Canadian, because it figures au revers of our pièces de 10 since 1937. It endures as an emblem of imagination, innovation, and know how that built our country. Before you could even start building a ship, you needed the shipyard, you needed the shipwrights, um, you needed uh, you know, people to run the forges, you needed sailmakers, you needed riggers, there's a whole industry surrounding the building of a ship. So to get the timber, that means you needed sawyers up country somewhere, you needed people that were going to cut the trees, yard them out with oxen and horses, run them down the rivers to the sawmills, then you're going to have to bring all that timber, acres of timber, into Lunenburg by rail, I assume. And so then you have to build the ship, you have to raise the money to build the ship. Blacksmiths, sailmakers, riggers, shipwrights, you build the ship and then you have to maintain the ship. So a lot of those people are still employed maintaining this thing that they've built. You need people that are gonna buy the fish when they come back with fish, you need people that are gonna build the dories, you need people that are gonna sell you fish hooks and wet gear and food for the ships. It, it's a, a single ship. Is a, is a big thing. A fleet of ships is a massive thing. That's enough to drive the economy of the province. Lunenburg without Blue Nose wouldn't be here. Uh, Blue Nose without Smith and Rulin wouldn't be here. And Smith and Rulin wouldn't be here without the workers. When the keel was laid, everything was done outdoors. And that happened just slightly to the left side of the Blue Nose two building as you look at it. So the Blue Nose original was built there, Blue Nose two was built inside the shed, and that for me became territory that was virtually hallowed. I have a whole trunk of all tools that were used on the Blue Nose and the Blue Nose two. They're all wooden ones, right? The old style. It's really neat. And the instrument most used was called the NADS, A-D-Z-E. They take the ads and there'd be three or four guys and they'd be chatting around and doing a rounding it off for the ribs and for the mass and things like that. But the ads was a key component of making the mass for the Blue Nose and, and, and not only that, the Marjorie and Dorothy and all these other Caroline Rose and whatever, all those other ships of the same era as the Blue Nose. <laughs> You know, if you need uh, poles, if you needed uh, handles for your for your tools, that's what the uh, Mi'kmaq people would do. You, if you need a, a pick handle or an axe handle, or, or that's what our our ancestors did, and um, and they were good at it. And and people would go and not so much give money. Sometimes you just trade. You know, you might trade for eggs butter, milk, um, you know, pork, things like that. Because a lot of times, uh, great-grandfather didn't get money. Um, and if he did, he would get, uh, for his big basket, 35 cents or 25 cents. And uh, But a lot of times he would get, uh, just trade things. Yeah, so, Joe Jeremy was my great-grandfather. He was well known for making very good quality mass tubes. So he would, he would soak his wood in the on the shore, just under the water, and um, and he would always go get his wood in the morning and make a basket. Well, one morning my father said he watched great grandfather walk over, and he heard him. He was he was very upset, and he said, "Well, he was he was saying some words in Mi'kmaq that was not really good." So he said, all of a sudden he saw great grandfather push his old wooden rowboat, pushed it off and jumped in the rowboat and started rowing across the river. Right across the river, there was a beaver house. So he pulled up on the beaver house, walked up, got his wood back. 
So at night, beavers are nocturnal. The beaver would swim across, get great grandfather's wood and take it over and put it on his house. <laughs> Lunenburg has a, a very long and, and proud shipbuilding tradition. Um, the, the, the shipyard in which Blue Nose was built, the Smith and Ruin shipyard, um, located here on the Lunenburg waterfront, was largely responsible for building um, and constructing Lunenburg's Banks fishing fleet during the first half of the 20th century. Um, and what would often happen actually would be that, um, th that these schooners, these, these new vessels, would, um, would, would be purchased and acquired by a, a Lunenburg firm or a Nova Scotia firm, and they would fish out of, um, for a Nova Scotia company, often for you know, a decade or between a decade and two decades, and then they would be sold to, uh, to Newfoundland firms, um, where, the, where there wasn't the same type of a shipbuilding tradition. The, the forests, of course, were um, in Newfoundland grow slower and were cut down much earlier, um, so they didn't have quite the ability to to, to build large um, ships, certainly had a strong boat building tradition, but less of a ship building tradition. So, um, so our vessels would often then make it, make them down, make it down to Lunenburg, or sorry, to, to Newfoundland, and they would fish for a, New, a Newfoundland company for a number of years, and um, in the end would, would often be sold to the West Indies again, and then would, would turn into uh, um, freighters in the West Indies where they would, they would um, freight goods between um, islands down south. Um, and, uh, and that, of course, ended up being Blue Nose's fate. Timber measured, cut and pinned, loved by sea and embraced by wind. A vision true with beauty and lines, grown through the years, transformed by the times. Now, I get goosebumps when I read this, I just do. As with Blue Nose, some hands of skill and vision, built from plans, trades and craft, honed so fine, timbers true in oak and pine. A ship of grace, a ship of might, a ship of breadth and broad delight. So call this ship Blue Nose, as she slides down into the Atlantic Sea. It's my pleasure to join you today as we commemorate a national icon. 100 years ago, the Blue Nose set sail right here in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia from the famed Smith and Rulin shipyard. The original Blue Nose was a one of a kind fishing and racing schooner and she had a long and vibrant life. She reached many corners of the globe, astonishing everyone with her presence. With Lunenburg's own Captain Angus Walters at the helm, Blue Nose would defeat all competitors on the racing circuit for 17 years. As a global sailing ambassador, Blue Nose 2 continues to be a symbol of Canadian pride, representing Nova Scotia's shipbuilding heritage and our province's vital fishing and marine industries. It's a tourism and economic driver here on the South Shore, providing unique employment opportunities for Canadian youth interested in experiencing and learning the ropes of traditional sailing. Today, Blue Nose 2 is marveled at by visitors from all over Canada and around the world who come to bask in her beauty and her rich heritage. I want to thank the Blue Nose 100 Committee for bringing us together to mark this centennial, celebrating and helping to ensure that the legend of the Blue Nose continues to remain alive for future generations. I am the daughter of Audrey Smith who christened the original Blue Nose. And she was the daughter of Richard Smith of the partnership Smith and Rowland, of the shipyard Smith and Rowland. I have a copy of a postcard that she wrote. She wrote it to her Aunt Carrie and said, can you imagine me, the only woman on here? Did you say nervous? Well, I should say so. If you look hard enough, and the postcard was a picture of the christening, if you look hard enough, you will see Uncle Angus, then me, and Papa, meaning her father, bending over, helping me on board. In reviewing kind of the history of the christening and launching of the, of the original Blue Nose, I was told this story by Heather Getson, who at that time was a curator at the Fisheries Museum. And she was able to review the minutes of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the WCTU, 
which was a very powerful organization in town. There were some women, don't forget women, did, were very strong in Lunenburg. And um, they apparently, <laughs> the evils of alcohol, they were going to suggest to the powers that be, I'm sure, to Angus and my grandfather and a few other people that the champagne should not be used. Only grape juice should be used. Needless to say, that did not go over too well with the gentleman and mother and, and used a bottle of champagne and not a bottle of grape juice. But that was just one of the stories that I heard about the original. Mother was the oldest of four children and the young, there were three daughters and a son and the youngest was Roderick. And he was only about seven when the Blue Nose was launched. And he and a friend, because they, they knew they wouldn't allow them on board, got up early and snuck on board. And they fell asleep. I don't know what time they, I think the launching was around 10 o'clock. And they woke up. They were in a sail locker or something. They woke up when they started what they call wedge, when they started to knock out the blocks for, for the launching. And anyway, it was through Ralph who documented it that it, it, Grandpa Dick's son actually snuck on board. Hello everyone. As the Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage and the MLA for Lunenburg, it is such an honor to join you in celebrating the pride of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, Blue Nose, the most famous ship in Canadian history. Blue Nose was in a league of its own both as a racing and fishing vessel. Canadians have carried it in their pocket for decades. It's the image immortalized on the Canadian dime. It connects us all to the sea and the skill, hard work and teamwork needed to sail through any storm. But really, Blue Nose is a symbol of community. It wasn't just shipwrights and sailmakers but people from the entire community coming together, making all the materials needed to build a world champion schooner. So this centennial, as we celebrate 100 years of Blue Nose's reign, we are also celebrating the determination and spirit found in communities across this land. A determination and spirit that stretches back thousands of years here in McMoggy. As a racing vessel, Blue Nose had no equal. Her crews exemplified the tenacity that other schooner crews were measured against. As a fishing vessel, Blue Nose could carry half a million pounds of fish per trip and brought in some of the largest catches ever recorded by a schooner. So Blue Nose also represents the relationship we have to the ocean, our economy and our environment, our tie together forever. The proud spirit of Captain Angus Walters and his crew 100 years ago still echoes in the hearts and minds of the many young Canadians who join Blue Nose crew each spring. I wish them and you fair winds and a very happy 100th anniversary. Thank you. The old timers told me, and I was blessed enough to, to meet some of them, um, they had great times on the fishing schooners, they really did. Um, but you talk to them for a while and, and after that they would tell you we just didn't know any better. And that's true for a lot of, of Nova Scotia and Canada at the time in the, in the 20s and 30s. You know, staying ashore was no picnic either. Running a farm was no picnic. Drying fish was no picnic. Raising the kids without a husband was no picnic. Um, I think life everywhere was hard that time. I think it was particularly hard on, on the Grand Banks in a powerless fishing schooner. Um, but I think everywhere life was hard and, and you just did what you did to get by. During the heyday of the fisheries, the, the banks were, were swarming with, with fishing schooners. I've, I've never heard or seen an actual figure for how many vessels were out there at, at one given time. 
but there were surely hundreds, if not thousands, of, of vessels that fished on the banks um, at any point in, in time during these heyday years. Um, and uh, and these, these vessels, they really they came from, from across um, northeastern North America, from the maritime provinces, as well as um, from um, the, the northern part of, of um, New England and, and other parts of the United States. And they also came over from Europe, um, particularly um, country, from countries like Portugal and France. A lot of people don't necessarily realize that um, these fishermen weren't actually fishing off the sides of these schooners. Instead, they were launching smaller vessels known as dories, and particularly the bank dory, which was a 15-foot dory. And two men would work in this smaller dory, fishing all around the vessel. There were two ways in which dories could be unloaded. One was referred to as a flying set, and that was when dories were towed behind a schooner and would let go basically at, at various points, generally about a, a half a kilometer, a kilometer distance from another, and, and cover the fishing grounds that way. And, and that meant that you had a, a far stretch of, uh, of the grounds that could be fished on, um, rather than being limited to just the confines of where the vessel was. The, uh, the other method was for um, the schooner to anchor and for the dories to be unloaded and then span out in, in every direction. And again, the idea was to cover as much fishing ground as possible. So in the world of the schooner fishery, the cod was king. Um, cod was the, was the choice fish that pretty well all crews went after. There were, of course, various trips when you know, a, a schooner may go halibutting, for example. Um, but generally speaking, cod was the, was, the main, was the main choice. Blue Nose was built as a salt cod um, fishing vessel. Um, and, uh, and that's a process in which the, the, the fish is all preserved in salt. However, in 1936, she did have two diesel engines installed into her second fish hold, and that en enabled Blue Nose to engage in fresh fishing as well. There's one story I can tell you from a, a Lunenburg County vessel, um, and it just sort of sums up what life could be like on these vessels and, and some of the conditions in which they work. So there was one morning where a, uh, the, the, the fog was, was some thick, and, uh, and it, was, it was just greasy all around. Um, and the boys were standing out around the deck waiting for the old man to come out. And uh, they were wondering, you know, were they going to get a day off? Was this going to be a rare day to maybe go down and uh, um, play some cards or, um, you know, re read a book, that sort of thing. But eventually out, out comes the captain out of the, out of the, uh, um, the wheel, opens the wheelhouse door, him with his, with, um, his little dog, Bozo. And, uh, and he, he hollers, bait up, boys! And he looks down at Bozo and he says, now you get back inside, it's not fit for a dog out here. Lunenburg managed to become somewhat self-sufficient in, in the fishery. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, vessels were, were built in Lunenburg, outfitted in Lunenburg, the food was grown in Lunenburg County, the crews came from Lunenburg County. Um, they were, with, with a few, you know, very small uh, exceptions, um, most of, of the processes involved in the fishery could be done right here in town. Um, and that meant that the, the fishery was ultimately a, a critical part in the development um, of, of the, the, uh, the town and of the community. But it also had real um, true social implications for, for how families lived and, and how families operated as well. Women were responsible for managing a family's entire affairs. They, they ran farms while um, also raising families and uh, um, as men were, were absent for, for long periods of the year. Blue Nose, for example, fished out, out of Zwicker & Co. Um, and Zwicker & Co., which is located here on the Lunenburg waterfront, outfitted Blue Nose and then would take on Blue Nose's catch once uh, um, Blue Nose would return to port. The fish would then be typically handed over to one of um, Lunenburg's many fish makers, which were basically um, individuals and, and small companies that would um, manage flake yards. So these are the, the drying platforms that the salt cod would be laid out to dry and, and they would be responsible for, for drying the cod and, and turning it over um, to, uh, regularly throughout the day to ensure that it dried properly and, and generally caring for it throughout the, the curing process, at which point it would then be, it would be taken over again by um, one of the local firms and often exported um, elsewhere down uh, down south to the West Indies was a was a major market for uh, um, for Lunenburg salt cod. Hello, I'm Mayor Matt Risser of the town of Lunenburg, the home port of the Blue Nose. When she was built a hundred years ago, the Blue Nose showcased the best of Lunenburg's seafaring economy in shipbuilding 
and the fishery. She was built at the Smith and Rulin shipyard, which is still on our working waterfront today. She was built quickly too, in just four months, so she could join the Grand Bank season as a working fishing schooner. With her eligibility secure for the 1921 International Fishermen's Cup, her racing legend began. Let's think back to 1921 for a moment. The world was just a few short years past World War I. The disastrous influenza pandemic of 1918 to 1920 had just ended. We now know better than ever what that must have felt like. Blue Nose's success in the racing world was a much needed shot in the arm. The nicknamed Queen of the North Atlantic brought a sense of pride and community to Lunenburg, to Nova Scotia, and to Canada. There's a reason she's the most famous sailing ship in Canadian history. Blue Nose is featured on stamps, coins, artworks, and in songs. Her inspiring legacy is everywhere in this town. The replica Blue Nose II was built here in Lunenburg as well, at the same shipyard. Our public school is Blue Nose Academy, our waterfront is skirted by Blue Nose Drive, and numerous businesses and associations in town bear the Blue Nose name. Going out for a sail on the Blue Nose II is an uplifting experience that we share with visitors to this day. It's heartwarming for us to be able to share a hundred years of this storied legacy, and we look forward to many, many more. When you looked out in the harbor going to bed, and they have widow's walks on many of the homes around here, but you could see up to 150 schooners. And at eight o'clock in the morning, there was not a ship in the harbor. They had all gone. So the people that took those ships to the Grand Banks are in equal favor as the people that built the ships for them to go to the banks in. In the spring of 1926, Blue Nose was fishing off the coast of Sable Island when she was caught in a great storm. Fearing for their lives, Captain Angus Walters lashed himself to the wheel for over eight hours and successfully rode out the storm, saving the lives of himself, his crew, and as well as saving the vessel. When the storm had finally settled, um, crew members Clem Hiltz and Maurice Slonis were tasked with shoveling off the sand from the deck of Blue Nose that had accumulated from Sable Island. Um, seeing this as a, as a remarkable experience, um, Lonis grabbed this small medicine bottle, filled it with sand, and took it home as a, as a, a memento of their harrowing experience. Angus, of course, I, you know, he was getting up in age that I, when I remember him, but there are a couple of things that I remember about him because you know, once you get to be 16 and can drive the car and a few things like that. My mother often would run out of milk and he was running the dairy. So she'd send me down to the dairy to get milk and I would always have to go knock on the back door. And Angus was usually in his kitchen sitting in a rocking chair. This is my memory of him. And um, he, he kind of scared me. He was, um, he was quite short, small in stature, but he, he kind of didn't suffer fools easily, and he was kind of grumpy, I thought, at that young age, a little taciturn, but always pleasant enough. But that's my primary memory, and another memory, he came to my wedding, and I always remember my, my husband at that time shaking hands with him, and thinking he had one of the largest hands he'd ever, and strongest hands he'd ever shaken. People often ask me, would Blue Nose 2 beat the Blue Nose in a race? And I always say, absolutely not, because those guys would have sailed the pants off us. So I look at, at Captain Angus and the crew and, and the people that sailed with him, they're like the Tiger Woods of, of sailors, and that they grew up at the kitchen table listening to their fathers and their uncles and their cousins tell stories about sailing from tiny kids. They would 
learn the terminology. When the boats come in, they would go down and hang around on the boats. You know, there'd be waterfront wharf rats. Um, and they, this stuff was ingrained in them for generations. Uh, so they knew what it was, they knew how it worked, and then they would go as young boys, like 12 and 13 years old, you're going out to the Grand Banks as a throater. You know, that's incredible. Um, so you have a chance to, to build up these skills and build up these skills. So by the time you become a racing crew for Captain Angus Walters, you're, you're a pretty smart guy when it comes to this stuff. You've seen a lot, you've seen stuff break, you've seen stuff need two inches of adjustment and, you, and it just feels better. And these guys were, all of them, all of the fishing schooner guys were, were good at what they did. You had to be. Otherwise you didn't go or you didn't come back. I'm often asked uh, how close Blue Nose and Blue Nose 2 are uh, in the design. Um, to the best of my knowledge, and I'm not a naval architect, uh, same length, same height, just about the same draft. I think we're a foot deeper. Um, basically, it's the same animal. You've got the same horsepower in the sails. You've got the same hull design as near as two ships could probably be. Um, so I think the two ships are, are fairly close in, in design, unless you're an absolute purist naval architect type. But if you see the Blue Nose sailing in along the waterfront of, of Lunenburg or in, in some small town in, in Nova Scotia, that's going to be what you saw. Uh, the differences um, fall within regulatory uh, aspects now. So you, know, you could build a Model T now, but you can't build a Model T without seat belts. For crewing the Blue Nose 2, we have Right now, between 18 and 20 people, um, depending on, on regulatory requirements and, and how long we're going to be away from home and time off considerations. Uh, so the six of us full time, there's captain, chief mate, second mate, bosun, uh, engineer and a cook. Um, so we're the people that come back every year and we're the people that look after the ship from a professional point of view. Uh, the young people that we have are principally from Nova Scotia. 80% of them are from Nova Scotia um, and they most of the time do not have any sail experience whatsoever. Um, so this is new to them. We have to teach them what the wheel is, what a head is, what the galley is. We have to teach them the whole new terminology. We have to put the ship together and then we have to teach them how to sail it. Uh, that That's a neat thing. And you look at the original Blue Nose would have had 26 people on board. Um, so she had a dozen dories, two people to a dory, and then, you know, Captain Cook, Throder, a couple of people left on the ship. Um, so you, today we're sailing the ship consistently shorthanded. And then if you look at the fact that we're taking young people on board that have no sailing experience, we're sailing it short knowledge as well. Um, so again, if you reflect back on how Captain Angus sailed the boat versus how I sailed the boat, you're looking at a whole different skill set on the ship. And including me, that, you know, if you look at what Ca Captain Angus's skill set was, you know, having a, an unpowered schooner on the Grand Banks and trying to tuck a reef in versus me tucking a reef in because I've got a good forecast and then motoring out into the harbor. So my skill set is, is less than theirs. And that, that's something that I reflect on often. Hello, I'm Doug Ettinger, President and CEO of Canada Post. I'm proud that I was born and raised in Nova Scotia. This legendary schooner captured the world's imagination a century ago, and indeed my own as a young boy learning about it in school. I'm also proud of the long relationship Canada Post has had with the Blue Nose. On January 8, 1929, we released our first Blue Nose stamp. Generations of collectors continue to call it one of the most beautiful stamps ever produced in this country. In fact, the stamp was so beloved and it represented the Canadian spirit so nicely that we featured it again on a commemorative stamp in 1982. We've also celebrated the stories of those whose lives were forever tied to the Blue Nose. 
like Captain Angus Walters in 1988, whose grandson I went to school with in Nova Scotia, and the ship's designer, William James Rui. We also honored him with a special stamp in 1998. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the launch of the Blue Nose in Lunenburg. Once again, Canada Post will celebrate her and will mark this milestone with a new special stamp issue on June 29th. A very happy 100th anniversary to the Blue Nose and those connected to her wonderful story. We can't wait to share our new stamps with you and Canadians all across this country. Thank you and stay safe. After watching the Blue Nose 2 sailing in and out of the harbor for a couple of years, I got up the nerve to walk, walk down there one day to get a job, um, never thinking for a moment they'd hire a Westerner, uh, but they did. And it ended up being a really important part of my sea career. At the time, you know, the, uh, the coverage, you know, in the 1920s and 30s when the races went on, the coverage was, was huge. Uh, it was a very, very big deal. And they, they used their best uh, writers and photographers uh, to do reportage on on these events. Lunenburg and Gloucester, these are the two towns, the two schooners that are going to race, um, and it's the, you know, it's national pride, it's New England, Nova Scotia pride, and it's family pride at, at that as well. Um, that relationship, sort of friendly rivalry, still exists today. Uh, it's manifested now uh, through the Dory Races and the International Dory Association. Um, but the American dory racers are not scared to come up alongside the Blue Nose and uh, the Blue Nose too, and tell us why their boat was better. Even today, a hundred years later, they will sit there and tell you why the Gertrude Tebow should have won the race, and or maybe the Columbia won the race, and um, that's that's fantastic. How how good is that? That that friendly rivalry and you know the elbow to the ribs is still there. I love taking the crew down and exposing them to that incredible. Gloucester history, um, Essex and the shipbuilding, and then you know it really, it really solidifies sort of what the story is about for them, and how great for Gloucester to have a blue nose in town. The American ship is just trailing the blue nose. Angus should never have agreed to this last race. She's too old. Eddie! Come on, Thompson, hold back! Get to it, Matt! Here's there's some kind of difficulty. Thompson's foul! Just one more, old girl. And you can rest. Her last race and still undefeated, the Blue Nose out of Lunenburg, Nova Scotia was fastest in the world for almost 20 years. Well, I'm quite sure the legacy comes from the fact of the people that built it and the people that sailed it and the people that fished it and the people that raced it because she operated in all of those uh, areas and with undeniable success. And she's a beautiful ship to look at. Once they had the 75th anniversary and they had the wonderful event at the museum commemorating it. I think she really quite enjoyed it. And so it came just about that same time that they had the 35th anniversary of the building and launching of Blue Nose 2. So mother went and to get down to the, the docks at that point, we 
took her in a wheelchair. She was not too happy to be in a wheelchair, but we didn't want her falling on the rough wharf. And so they had an event right by the Blue Nose too. And they had a birthday cake for the Blue Nose. And they asked Mother, as being the oldest woman involved with the original vessel, to cut the cake. And they said they wanted to join her with another lady. And she was the youngest gal crew member of the Blue Nose too at that time. And this is a picture of her cutting the birthday cake for Blue Nose too. The legacy of the Blue Nose is something I think at that time, that period, all Canadians and especially Nova Scotians and Lunenburgers uh, felt that that was because the Blue Nose touched the everyday person. For Canadians, you know, we, we built the most incredible ship. Or, or schooner, you know, in the world, it's it's incredible the the stream, the shape of it, and how fast it was, and you know, it's it's amazing uh, that it was done right here, and um, to have my great grandfather, and my family, be connected to the original one in some way is very special. You know, you know, when I build a birch bark canoe, there's a lot of ancestors around me in spirit smiling. And, and I'm sure today my father would be smiling and, and my great-grandfather would be smiling knowing that, uh, that his uh, legacy is being captured and, and, and told and, and passed on. Part of it is the time frame when the, when the story took place. So you're looking post-World War I, just after Vimy Ridge, four years after Vimy Ridge. Um, technology is changing. In the 20s, you're starting to look at, you know, through the Welland Canal, they're taking 400-foot steamships. The age of sail is dying off. Uh, technology is changing very quickly. Um, part of that's driven by, you know, all these things by military research, and, and you need bigger and better and faster. Um, but this story of man against the sea, man against man, you know, the races, the fishing, uh, is still echoing with the older people that are, that are struggling with this change. Um, and I think that whole story in that time of change in Canada, when Canada's trying to define itself, is really the Blue Nose struck just at the right time to have this story to, and to make this story important going forward. The Grand Bank schooners, fore and aft rigged on two masts, were strong, sturdy vessels able to carry large loads of salt fish and maneuverable enough to survive the storms and squalls of the North Atlantic. These wily captains would race these sleek vessels through all weather to get to market first. Out of this rivalry was born the International Fisherman's Race, an annual event which pitted the fastest of the U.S. schooners against the best of the Canadian fleet. And for 18 years, the race belonged to Blue Nose and her beloved captain, Angus Walters. Walter's ability to coax unmatchable speed from the schooner was legendary. Blue Nose became a symbol of the heart and soul of her Nova Scotia home, a symbol adopted by the entire nation of Canada. Today, an exact replica of the original, the Blue Nose II, sails to remind us of her majestic legend. <laughs>